Hi, uh, welcome to the seventh annual Lester Kissel Lecture. I'm Arthur Applebaum, Director of Undergraduate Fellowships at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. And on behalf of the center's director, Danielle Allen, I have the most pleasant task of introducing our speaker, Professor Pamela Carlin. But first, a few words about our dear Lester Kissel. Lester died in the year 2000 at the age of 98. He had been the managing director of Seward and Kissel, a major Wall Street law firm specializing in financial law, representing banks, investment funds, and the like. In his early 60s, he started reading Hindu ethics and asked himself, is this all there is to life? This being a lawyer for big banks. He began going to India, even had a guru, who taught him that reincarnation is real and that with sufficient study and good work, he might come back as a worthy soul. Kissel's long-standing interest in values and public and professional life led to his commitment to the ethics initiative at Harvard, beginning with early conversations and correspondence with President Derek Bach and later with President Neil Rudenstein and our center's founding director, Dennis Thompson. Lester would visit us in between his treks to India, and each time he would remind us rather oracularly to attend not only to ethics but to values and then he'd trot off again to India. In the fullness of time, Lester bequeathed to the center a really magnificent gift. I'd like to think that Lester would have admired this year's Kissel lecturer and deeply respected her life's work in defense of political rights and civil liberties. In turn, I think Pam Carlin would have been touched by Lester's reverence for all living creatures, including the human ones. Pamela Carlin is the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford Law School, where she founded and co-directs the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. Professor Carlin was educated at both Yale College and Yale Law School and went on to clerk for Justice Harry Blackman. Constitutional litigation became Professor Carlin's calling. She's argued nine cases before the Supreme Court, including voting rights cases, and has worked with her clinic students on the two landmark marriage equality cases United States versus Windsor and Obergefell versus Hodges. She was co-counsel in Windsor. She served on California's Fair Political Practices Commission and was appointed Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Department of Justice during the presidency of Barack Obama. She worked there on voting rights and anti-discrimination law and she received the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service for her work in implementing United States versus Windsor. She's the co-author of three leading case books in constitutional law, including the one most pertinent to this afternoon's lecture, The Law of Democracy, about which she is one of our leading authorities. Professor Carlin is committed to writing about constitutional law in a way that is accessible to the public. She is the co-author with Goodwin Liu and Christopher Schroeder of Keeping Faith with the Constitution, an engaging articulation of an approach to reading the Constitution they call constitutional fidelity. Rejecting the false choice between a mechanical originalism and a living constitution that grows and evolves to meet the changing needs of society, they argue that a judge's challenge in interpreting the meaning of the constitution is to explain, and I quote, how its text and principles retain their authority and legitimacy over decades and centuries. To be faithful to the constitution is to interpret its words and to apply its principles in a way that sustain their vitality over time. Professor Carlin's devotion to making the Constitution understandable comes not merely from the virtues of a master teacher, which she is, but from her view of the role of the Constitution is supposed to play in our political life. In a collection of her Boston Review essays entitled A Constitution for All Times, she argues that the Constitution is meant to be a document for the people and argued about by the people. She writes, the final theme of the book is the importance of public attention to an argument about what the Constitution means. On Constitution Day 1937, President Franklin Roosevelt reminded us that the Constitution is a layman's document, not a lawyer's contract. He spoke of an unending struggle between capacious and restrictive interpretations. President Roosevelt was right. That struggle continues today. Arguments over the meaning of equality, the scope of privacy in light of modern technology, and the nature of our criminal justice system are still too important to be left solely to the Supreme Court or to lawyers.
When we invited Professor Carlin to be this year's Kissel Lecturer, we of course knew that we'd have the pleasure of hearing from one of the nation's leading constitutional scholars. We didn't know that she would soon be brought into our homes, offices, and pockets uh, on our TV, computer, and phone screens as the nation's public educator on impeachment. Called to testify as an expert witness at the House Judiciary Committee impeachment hearings, Professor Carlin, along with Harvard's Noah Feldman, conducted a national tutorial on the Constitution's impeachment provisions. Anticipating the claim that impeachment in an election year is somehow undemocratic, she argued just the opposite. The framers of our Constitution realized that elections alone could not guarantee that the United States would remain a republic. One of the key reasons for including an impeachment power was the risk that unscrupulous officials might try to rig the election process. Now this follows from Professor Carlin's longstanding view that the Constitution is designed to enable and protect rather than to constrain democratic self-governance properly understood. Please join me in welcoming Pam Carlin, whose lecture is entitled Restoring Democracy, Lessons from Offender Reenfranchisement." Well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, and it's a pleasure uh, to be in front of a very different audience than the last time. I talked about the Constitution. Um, uh, Justice Brennan is famous for having said that there's no better test of a society than how it treats those accused of transgressing against it. And so when I was asked to give a lecture about democracy, uh, I thought that uh, what I would talk about is how America treats uh, the people uh, uh, who are accused, indeed convicted, of having transgressed against it in the, in the sphere of voting. Constitutional law is uh, often in the headlines, and I know all of you have seen lots of headlines about what the Supreme Court does and the like. Um, so it may seem strange that one of the most important things that the Supreme Court ever said about democracy was in a footnote, and it was in a footnote that appeared in a case involving the earth-shaking question whether Congress could forbid a corporation from shipping milnut, uh, which is a mixture of skim milk and coconut oil. It's like the predecessor of almond milk, for those of you uh, who get your lattes differentially now. But whether Congress could make it a crime to ship this milnut, this filled milk, across state lines from Illinois to Indiana. And in footnote four of the opinion where the court said that it was okay for Congress to do this, the court explained that in general, when courts look at challenges to the constitutionality of a federal statute or a state statute, they should presume that it's constitutional precisely because our democratic process has worked, as long as they can find some rational basis for the, uh, for the law. And rational basis just means, can I think of some way in which this law might be good enough? Uh, it's a very loose fit. Um, but the court identified two categories of laws that shouldn't get this kind of deference, that should instead be subjected to more exacting judicial scrutiny. That is, where courts should be more skeptical of what the political process has produced. And both of these categories centered on defects in what the court called the political processes by which individuals and groups can protect their rights uh, uh, directly. The first category that the court talked about here were those laws that restricted the political process itself. And here, the paradigmatic example that the court gave was laws that restrict the right to vote, that we should be skeptical of these laws. Uh, and the second category involved laws targeting what the court called discrete and insular minorities. That is, groups that were unable to protect themselves in the political process because of prejudice against them. A generation after the court did this, in 1938, uh, the court gave teeth to Caroline Product's suggestion. And Chief Justice Warren's opinion for the Supreme Court in a case called Kramer against Union Free School District that involved the question whether people who didn't own property in a school district should nonetheless be able to vote in the school board elections, said that because the right to exercise the franchise, the right to vote, is if in, in a free and unimpaired manner, is preservative of other basic civil and political rights, any alleged infringement of the right of citizens to vote must be carefully and meticulously scrutinized. Accordingly, rather than applying that deferential rationality review that I mentioned before, courts that were faced with a restriction on the right to vote had to determine whether the exclusion was necessary to promote a compelling state interest. That is, the fit 
between the law that was enacted and some really, really weighty government purpose had to be very tight. And even today, after a series of decisions that have moved towards a more flexible reading, uh, strict scrutiny remains the appropriate standard for any time a severe, uh, a severe burden uh, is imposed on the right to vote. And obviously disqualifying people altogether from voting is a severe burden. Now you might wonder why I just told you all of this. Um, here's the first irony. You might think that laws disenfranchising people because they've been convicted of, of a crime lie at the intersection of these two different reasons why courts should look really carefully and be really skeptical of laws. Because those laws deny the right to vote, that's part one, uh, and they deny it to individuals who are already the subject of tremendous antipathy, that is people who've been convicted of crimes. Argu arguably, these people should be getting double strict scrutiny. Um, but five years after the Supreme Court's decision in Kramer, the court flatly refused to give any real scrutiny at all to laws disenfranchising individuals convicted of a crime. In a case called Richardson against Ramirez, uh, that involved the reduction of representation clause in the Constitution, which is a clause that says that if a state denies the right to vote to any of its, uh, at that point, male citizens over the age of 21, uh, then the state would lose some of its seats in the House of Representatives. But that clause says if you deny the right to vote for any reason other than rebellion or conviction of a crime. Uh, and so the court said, well, that's an affirmative license to states to disenfranchise this group of people against whom there's tremendous antipathy. So here's a second irony. The court was looking at the 14th Amendment there, which is one of the three Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment guarantees, among other things, equal protection of law. And then the 15th Amendment says that you can't discriminate against citizens on the basis of race in voting. So here's the second irony. The whole purpose of the Reconstruction Amendments when it came to the right to vote was to ensure that the new freedmen would have the ability to vote in the South. So the 15th Amendment, which is the most explicit part of this, uh, potentially promised to enfranchise somewhere around roughly uh, 1.1 million black men because uh, I went back and looked at the census figures from 1870 and there were basically 1.1 million African American men over the age of 21. And you couldn't vote if you were under 21 and at that point you couldn't vote if you were a woman. So that's the number of people that the Reconstruction Amendments were going to enfranchise, 1.1 million. But today in the United States, offender disenfranchisement laws that prohibit people with criminal convictions from voting either when they're incarcerated or when they're on probation and parole, and sometimes for the rest of their life, depending on the state, disenfranchise more black men than were enfranchised by the Reconstruction Amendments. That is, somewhere around 1.1 million black men today do not have the right to vote because of a criminal conviction. Now, the reason I began by describing the process theory of the Supreme Court, that is, when will the courts look most uh, skeptically at laws, um, is because the story of offender reenfranchisement raises a very arresting question for that most influential and foundational theory. Efforts to gain reenfranchisement for ex offenders through the courts have been strikingly unsuccessful. The few successful attacks have involved smoking gun evidence that a state picked the particular crimes for which it was going to disenfranchise people entirely because it thought those crimes were more likely to be convicted by black people than white people. Um, but even that kind of overt racism is not of always enough. So let me give you an example of, a case, of, of one case, which is the Fifth Circuit's decision in a case called Cotton against Fordyce, which upheld a Mississippi constitutional provision that disenfranchised anyone convicted of, and I'll read you the list so you can hear it, murder, rape, bribery, theft, arson, obtaining money or goods under false pretenses, perjury, forgery, embezzlement, or bigamy. Right, so if, you commit, if you're convicted of one of those crimes, and I know you're all thinking, big of me, big of you. Um, but uh, the, the question is, why did they pick that list of crimes? Well, the Court of Appeals recognized that the original list of crimes, which was picked in 1890 as part of the infamous Constitutional Convention in Mississippi that was designed to, re, to disenfranchise and exclude black people from civic life in Mississippi altogether, was uh, the central purpose was, as the state's own Supreme Court said, to obstruct the exercise of suffrage by the Negro race. So that's why they did it. And the Fifth Circuit recognized that's why they did it in 1890. But nonetheless, it upheld this disenfranchising law because that purposeful exclusion was not enough 
to, uh, to rebut the presumption that the state had overcome this odious origin, origin by reenacting the law to include murder and rape, which hadn't been in the original list. Um, and the court kind of helpfully explained that those crimes were historically excluded from the list because they were not considered black. So now you've added two white crimes to the list, murder and rape, uh, and therefore it's perfectly fair to continue disenfranchising black people in Mississippi as well. So the constitutional challenges all failed. After a few interim successes, the challenges to offender and disenfranchisement under the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits even unintentionally discriminatory practices, also failed. Um, but by contrast, this is what the, the, I find so interesting. We've seen real progress towards restoration of offender voting rights within the political system. All of it obviously achieved without the votes of people who've been convicted of crimes. And this divergence goes back at least to the time of Richardson against Ramirez itself, because before the Supreme Court decided Richardson and upheld uh, California's then lifetime uh, ban on uh, ex-offender voting, uh, then Secretary of State Jerry Brown, who has been around for forever, right, Jer Jerry Brown was simultaneously, well not simultaneously, but in sequence, the youngest person ever to be elected governor of California and the oldest, which just shows F. Scott Fitzgerald was wrong about there not being second acts uh, in, American, in Americans' lives. But Secretary of State Jerry Brown actually filed a brief supporting the offender's challenge to the law uh, on the grounds that of its utter unrelatedness, he said, to any state interest. And less than six months after the Supreme Court told California could have a lifetime felon disenfranchisement provision, California voters repealed the challenged state constitutional provision um, and uh, came up with one that only disqualifies people from voting while they have been adjudicated mentally in in uh, incompetent or while they're in prison or while they're on parole. Uh, over the past two decades, nearly two dozen other states have changed their policies to offer offenders more opportunity to restore their voting rights. Uh, some of those states have repealed lifetime disenfranchisement altogether. Others have liberalized the way in which you can get back on the voting rolls. And Florida's Amendment 4, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in its distressing aftermath, is only the most recent example of this. And at the federal level, uh, the Democrats included in HR 1 their omnibus bill to deal with voting issues in America uh, and the first piece of legislation that they proposed after uh, they regained control of the House. They proposed as part of that a, Dem a Democracy Restoration Act. That act is designed to ensure that the right of an individual who's a citizen of the United States to vote in federal elections can't be denied or abridged because they've been convicted of a criminal offense unless they're actually serving time for the offense at the time of the election, which means that states will have to come up with a way of allowing people who are in pretrial detention to vote. They'll have to allow people who are on probation or parole uh, to vote. They'll have to allow people who finished their sentences to vote. And it turns out that reenfranchisement of ex-offenders is only the most recent illustration of a more general point about the law of democracy. Because many of the most significant gains in enfranchisement in our history have been the product of what uh, Justice Frankfurter memorably called an aroused popular conscience that sears the conscience of the people's representatives. Um, and I've always loved that image of searing the conscience of the people's representatives, you know, sort of like St. Lawrence on the gridiron, right? You sort of, you know, and you can, you would like go to Outback Steakhouse, and so each representative will have little kind of hash marks from having been seared. Um, but the point is actually not just a kind of amusing one, it's actually a, a, a true one, because, for example, in the five years after the Federal uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed, federal examiners under that act uh, registered at more African Americans in the South to vote than had been registered in the previous hundred years by all of the litigation uh, that had preceded it. Uh, and Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was one of the most monumental and transformative laws uh, in the history of American freedom, precisely because it didn't rely on constitutional litigation in front of the courts. It relied on an administrative process uh, to make sure that states couldn't put new uh, discriminatory laws into effect. The, the recent progress on restoration of felons' rights uh, challenges the conventional understanding in another way as well. The 21st century has seen the emergence of what Professor Dan Takaji memorably called the new vote denial. After a period of time, really from 1965 until the year 2000, in which there was bipartisan support for expanding voting rights, 
Uh, we've now seen that disappear. Recent years have seen the enactment of draconian voter ID laws. Uh, I've never been asked anywhere to show an ID for voting, and yet if you try to vote in a state like Texas, they demanded you have one of nine forms of government-issued ID, which memorably included uh, concealed carry permits, but did not include uh, municipal IDs for workers for municipal governments, nor did it include University of Texas photo IDs for students. Um, uh, but there's a series of laws like the draconian voter ID laws, there are cutbacks to early voting, which is really important in many African-American communities where Sunday voting, the so-called souls to the polls, is a way that people uh, exercise their right to vote along with, uh, along with other members of their community. Uh, laws that make it harder to register, laws that make it harder to have a ballot counted. There was recently a, a wonderful ruling in the Ninth Circuit saying that the way Arizona was refusing to count some provisional ballots violated the law. But series of laws trying to cut back on people's ability to cast a vote and to have that vote counted. So uh, some of these measures have been enacted by the very states that have also liberalized the laws uh, regarding offender disenfranchisement at the same time. So here's a fundamental question. What might explain the countercyclical headway being made on reintegration of offenders into the political community at the same time that other long marginalized groups face new barriers? To drill down on that question requires us, I think, to see how offender reenfranchisement uh, plays into what I've described earlier as the tripartite nature of the right to vote. So I think voting has really three different kinds of functions and three different, uh, three different things it performs. The first of these is about participation, which is the ability to cast a ballot and have it counted uh, regardless uh, of the outcome. And that signals your full membership in the political community as one of those who governs rather than one who's, who merely uh, is governed. The second is the idea of aggregation, which is not just about the right to ha cast a ballot and have it counted, but the right or the ability to cast a ballot that uh, elects somebody or decides a proposition. So that's about the ability to, to join with like-minded voters to achieve the election of your candidates of choice. And the third thing that voting is about, of course, is that you, you don't vote just to elect somebody to office. Rather, uh, you care about achieving your preferred policies through representative decision making. That is, you vote for members of Congress in the hope that those people will then enact laws that, that fit your policy preferences and the like. The restoration movement, I'm going to suggest, is tied to all three of these. And its progress and the resistance that it faces um, reflect how those concepts of participation and aggregation and governance all uh, interact with each other. So let's start with participation. The right to vote serves a powerful expressive function regardless of election outcomes. I mean, for most of you, I imagine in this audience, voting in Massachusetts, uh, you're voting for the winning side in your local elections an awful lot. But I tell you, you can end up uh, living in the reddest of red states if you're blue or the bluest of blue states if you're red, and yet your vote still is an important thing for you to have because uh, it delineates who is and who isn't a full member of the community capable of rational self-governance. Or as Justice Albie Sachs of the South African Constitutional Court once said, and he is a man who not coincidentally spent rather a lot of time uh, in prison during the apartheid era. He said it this way, he said the voice, and, and this is in a case where the South African Constitutional Court held that people in South Africa have to have the right to vote even while they're incarcerated for conviction of a crime. And he said, the vote of each and every citizen is a badge of dignity and of personhood. Quite literally, it says that everybody counts. In a country of great disparities of wealth and power, it declares that whoever we are, rich or poor, exalted or disgraced, we all belong to the same democratic nation, that our destinies are intertwined in a single interactive polity. On this account of participation, the lumping together of aliens uh, and the other categories were known as idiots, insane persons, and illiterates with criminal offenders, and that's the common formulation of a lot of these old disenfranchisement laws, is you can't vote if you're uh, convicted, or you're an idiot, or you're insane, uh, or uh, you're an alien. Um, that common formulation makes sense. Each of these groups is seen as outsiders, or as otherwise unfit to take part in the process of governing, right? And so the, the expressive function of denying participation is to say you are literally an outlaw. You are outside of the lawmaking function. Um, moreover, offender disenfranchisement rests on the social contractarian idea 
that those who will be bound by the laws should have some say in what those laws are. The disenfranchisement of offenders on this account reflects the idea that those who fail to abide by the law have broken their side of the contract, and so the contract is now null and void. Um, as Judge Friendly put it in a case upholding New York's uh, uh, restriction on offender voting, a man who breaks the laws he has authorized his agent to make for his own governance could fairly have been thought to have abandoned the right to participate in further administering that compact. I think what's broken down over the past several decades is the idea that categorical uh, exclusion of offenders serves any of the goals of punishment or exclusion other than just retribution itself. Uh, in Trope Against Dulles, which is a Supreme Court case that held that it violates the cruel and unusual punishment clause of the Constitution for a state to strip you of your citizenship, the court said that taking away your citizenship is a form of punishment more primitive than torture. But the court then contrasted that notion with the loss of the right to vote. And it said when it comes to the loss of the right to vote, that's not punitive at all. It's just regulatory. It's just a reasonable ground of eligibility, a non-penal exercise of the power to regulate the franchise. What's broken down is no one in public discourse today defends that proposition. That is, no one today says the reason to disenfranchise people from, for, from voting is to deter crime. I mean, it's hard to imagine the person who isn't deterred by a criminal conviction saying, oh, but if I also lose my right to vote, well, that's why I'm not going to rob the bank. Um, it can't do anything to incapacitate people because it's not clear what it incapacitates you from. And it's certainly not going to rehabilitate you. So it's completely about retribution. And here's where one aspect of what I think of as governance bleeds back, if you will, into participation. Think here about things like the recent passage of the First Step Act, or California's realignment, uh, or the decriminalization in many states of drug-related activities. Each of these developments reflects a growing public conviction that we're branding too many people as criminals and inflicting far too severe consequences on even those lawbreakers who do warrant some punishment. The revitalization in large parts uh, of the population of the ideas that um, corrections are supposed to correct, that is to rehabilitate and to redeem, um, I think that also fits, fits into the restoration movement because the rhetoric of the movement focuses on giving individuals who have paid their debt to society, which is expressly contractarian language, the ability to reintegrate themselves. Restoration is indeed a largely costless and heavily symbolic way to, to signal that reentry. And you might note that the US restoration movement uh, has not yet really pressed to enfranchise still incarcerated citizens despite the fact that countries all, uh, from uh, Canada to South Africa to Germany uh, to Israel do so. Now step back for a moment to the, uh, from this to think about the new, the new vote denial as well. It's striking that the share of Americans who support restoration, roughly two thirds of likely voters say that they believe that once somebody has paid their debt to society, uh, they should have the right to vote again is virtually identical to the share of likely voters who think citizens should be required to show an ID in order to vote. And the number of citizens effectively barred uh, from voting uh, by either ID, ID requirements or by uh, offender disenfranchisement requirements are roughly similar. So what accounts for the coincidence rise of voter ID laws and the decline in the severity of offender disenfranchisement provisions? Well, I think one factor is clearly the lack of any kind of consequentialist argument for offender disenfranchisement. We no longer really think, if we ever did, that disenfranchising offenders protects against vote fraud. By contrast, the narrative of voter ID is almost entirely driven by claims, claims that are completely specious, by the way, that it somehow presents a re prevents a real risk of fraud to have people uh, show their IDs. Um, uh, I, I was one of the lawyers who helped to litigate the first of these cases to go up to the Supreme Court, which was a case from Indiana about uh, voter ID in Indiana. And uh, in discovery, the state was asked, how many examples can you give in the history of Indiana, which goes back to 1837, of in-person voter impersonation fraud? That is, somebody coming in and claiming to be somebody other than who they were at the polls. Um, and the state could not come up with a single example um, and that was what they said voter ID would prevent. Um, by contrast, um, because they required that the ID be currently valid, in the first election after the ID law went into effect, 
um, one of the polling places in South Bend, Indiana, uh, was a convent. It was the rec hall of a convent. And there were eight retired nuns who wanted to go and vote. Um, and the poll worker at that convent was herself a nun of their order. Um, and the nuns went down there, but they didn't, they, because they're all retired and they're too old to drive, they didn't have current driver's licenses. They had old ones. And so showing that the, the letter of the law killeth, um, as I've heard from that part of the Bible, um, uh, the nun who was at the desk said, you can't vote because you don't have currently valid government-issued IDs. So in one election in, Al in, in Indiana, more retired nuns were disenfranchised than all the documented examples of vote fraud uh, in the history of the state, of in-person vote fraud. Um, so that's the argument. Um, and on top of that, the arguments about personal responsibility seem to be playing out differently in the two areas. So when it comes to offender reenfranchisement, um, uh, we talk about the problem with a lot of the current laws being that they make it too hard for ex-offenders to get back on the rolls. And uh, what's going on in Florida is a perfect example of this, which is if you have to show that you've paid all of the fines and dealt with all of the fees that were imposed on you, it's sometimes very difficult. Or in some states, you have to write essentially an essay about why you feel that you've been uh, rehabilitated before you can get back on the rolls. And these are difficult things to do. Um, by contrast, uh, most most Americans and many courts seem to think that obtaining a government-issued photo ID is so easy that it's perfectly reasonable uh, to require people to do that. And I imagine most of you in the room today have some form of government-issued photo ID, whether it's a driver's license or a passport uh, or a military ID card or the like. But it's shocking how many Americans don't have that form of ID. Uh, and it's not surprising that they tend to be disproportionately poor uh, and disproportionately members of minority groups. And for some of these people, it's actually extraordinarily difficult for them to get an ID, uh, either because they don't have the money to get the free, the, the, pay, the documents you have to pay for to get the free ID, because states are required to give you a free ID in order to vote, or because uh, they don't have the sophistication required to deal with the government bureaucracies, or because, for example, we had um, uh, witnesses in the Texas case who uh, were born at home and didn't have birth certificates. And so without the birth certificate, they couldn't get the other IDs they needed. Or their parents had misspelled their name on the birth certificate. Um, so they didn't have current IDs that matched their birth certificates. Um, so for a lot of people, it's not easy to get these documents. But the most striking difference, I think, seems to be the acoustic separation of part in the participation and aggregation arguments about the discussion of felon uh, uh, restoration. So there's widespread bipartisan support for one form or another of offender reenfranchisement. Um, I'm just going to read you the names of a couple of people who support it, because I think it will shock you, given what else they've uh, said in recent years. Uh, Lindsey Graham, Rick Santorum, Orrin Hatch, Rand Paul, George W. Bush, the Koch brothers, they all think that people who have finished serving their sentences should have the right to vote. Or look at the recent results in the election in Florida for Amendment 4, which reenfranchises people. Florida, for many years, uh, disenfranchised people for life for conviction of any felony, even a felony where you were never sent to prison or jail in the first place. You could never vote uh, again. Um, so here's the thing. In the last election, the election where they en enacted Amendment 4, Republicans won both the governorship and the US Senate seat from uh, Florida, uh, both by razor thin margins. And yet nearly 65% of Florida voters supported offender restoration. So if you just do the math, you'll realize that the minimum number of Republican voters who voted for uh, felon, felon reenfranchisement was at least a third of them. And it might well be more than that, because there might be some voters who voted for the Democratic candidates who voted against. But what about the aftermath to Amendment 4? The aftermath offers a powerful illustration of how the treatment of voting rights becomes more polarized once aggregation concerns enter, uh, enter the uh, arena. Offender restoration in Florida presents the prospect that more than 1.4 million Floridians can join the voting rolls, in which is, if you think about it, that's a shocking number of people who were disenfranchised. But that's the number who can get reenfranchised. Uh, most social scientists who study the issue assume that turnout rates and candidate preferences among ex-offenders will mirror the turnout rates 
uh, and candidate preferences of otherwise demographically similar compatriots. So when you take into account age, race, location, and the like, uh, ex-offenders are likely to vote the same way, uh, more or less, as people who were never convicted. They might participate at a slightly lower rate, but a lot of that is just a product of socioeconomics. That is, people, uh, low-income people tend to vote less often uh, than higher-income people. But if even a, only a small fraction of that 1.4 million had voted in the last election, their votes could well have swung the election the other way. And politicians quite understandably assume that a group of voters who are disproportionately non-white, as the offender population in Florida is, and disproportionately low income, as that population is as well, will likely increase the share of votes going to Democratic candidates. So it's not surprising, even if it is depressing, that the Republican-controlled Florida state legislature has enacted a series of laws designed to restrict Amendment 4 scope. And there's litigation going on right now challenging uh, those laws, which require people to have paid back all of the court costs, for example, of their conviction uh, and the like before they can, uh, before they can uh, get onto the rolls. So there's this divergence between popular support and politician resistance to reenfranchisement. And that resembles yet another issue in voting rights, which is term limits. Nearly all term limits uh, in the United States have been imposed through direct democracy rather than through ordinary legislation. And the same is true for the recent emergence of independent redistricting commissions in a lot of states, most recently in the last election uh, in Michigan. Uh, these things uh, tend to be things that voters want, but that politicians really don't which returns us to the idea of the political process theory that I started out, us out with. Uh, you'll remember that I said that the Supreme Court says that one of the reasons courts have to look carefully is when, the politicians, restri when politicians restrict the right to vote and the way to participate in the political process to change things. So that's what John Hardily referred to as the ins, essentially uh, legislating to keep the ins in and the outs out. Um, that they choke off the channels of political change, what we might call uh, the problem of entrenchment by uh, the existing order. That po professional po politicians would, pre would prefer to restrict the franchise to the existing franchise is absolutely sensible as a matter of, uh, a, a matter of practicality, because after all, they know the people who are now voting will elect them. And there's always a risk if you add people to that that they won't get reelected. Now, here's one of the things that I thought was most interesting as I kind of worked my, way through, uh, worked my way through Florida, which is that the effects of disenfranchisement and restoration on the actual outcome of elections, on the aggregation uh, function, may turn out to be most salient at the highest levels, that is, in terms of presidential elections and statewide elections, and not when it comes to local elections, which is where you might have thought that adding some people uh, would help. And the reason for this is, um, because of another aspect of the way American elections run, which is the creation of safe majority minority districts in large parts of the country. For years, activists like Peter Wagner, who if you haven't read his stuff, you should go to, he, ha he runs this website called Prisoners of the Census, and it's absolutely fantastic, uh, the materials he's put together. They've been pointing out that a key consequence of our current system, which largely counts prisoners where they are incarcerated, rather than in the communities where they previously lived and to which they're going to return, is that political power gets allocated away from those areas and towards the areas where the prisons are built, which tend to be upstate if you're in New York or downstate if you're in Chicago. But they tend to be, um, it, it, some people have suggested it almost tends to be two groups of young men that we have to find something to do. One group we incarcerate and the other we turn into corrections officers. Um, and so. When you count the prisoners where they uh, are located uh, uh, in these rural jurisdictions, uh, rather than in the places they live, that transfers political power towards the places where they're being counted. Offender reenfranchisement is not going to change that at all. It's important to understand because the population base that determines whether a particular apportionment satisfies equipopulous districting is going to remain in effect. And thus, Reenfranchised voters may end up being concentrated in districts that already elect local officials, state legislators, and perhaps even members of the U.S. House of Representatives that already reflect the party preferences of the enfranchised. That is, if you if you put these people back into the back into their communities, those communities are already electing people who who uh, who. who um, share their policy. So let me give you the example. I kind of worked through the math in Florida in the 2018 election. 
So in 2018, the margin of victory for the Republican candidate for governor and the Republican candidate for senator in Florida were 32,463 and 10,033 votes respectively. So that's the margin of victory over millions and millions of votes cast. It's easy to see how offender reenfranchisement could swamp those margins. You bring in 1.4 million people, even if only 10% of them vote, that's 140,000 people. And if they break 60-40, that will swamp this margin. But now look at Florida's 27 House of Representative seats, right? Florida has 27 seats in the US Congress. In only one of those districts, one out of 27 was the margin of victory less than 10,000 votes. And in only three additional districts was the margin of victory under 40,000 votes. That is, these were all safe seats, either for the Democrat or for the Republican. You'd need a huge number of people to be added to the rolls and to break really strongly in one direction or the other to change those results. And five districts were not even contested by the Republicans, uh, three of which are heavily African-American districts. So all of the reenfranchisement in the world is not going to change uh, the result there. So it may turn out that the two areas where restoration has its biggest direct electoral consequences are statewide elections, which also include elections for the president in states where it's winner take all uh, electoral college votes, uh, and then in direct democracy and in initiatives going forward. The two aspects of the political process where aggregation rules have very little effect. Finally, let's return to voting as governance. As I suggested earlier, the push towards offender reenfranchisement did not arise in a vacuum. Almost every public discussion of offender disenfranchisement trots out statistics about the huge increase in the number of people disenfranchised by such laws and about the staggering percentage of the African American community that's directly excluded. For example, in 1976, shortly after the Supreme Court upheld uh, offender uh, disenfranchisement in the Richardson against Ramirez case, about 1.7 million individuals nationwide were stripped of their right to vote. By 2016, that number was estimated to be 6.1 million people, which is roughly the population of Maryland, or if you think about it this way, like seven congressional seats. Those statistics tap into concerns about overcriminalization more generally, about overincarceration, and about over-policing as matters of straight-up criminal justice policy. And once support begins to grow for the idea that we criminalize too much conduct, that we prosecute too many people, and that we punish people too severely, we can start to look at many aspects of offender disenfranchisement with a fresh eye. Consider one of the issues that is not, at least not yet, really on the table in the United States, which is, should incarcerated people be entitled to vote? When I raise that issue in class, when I, teach the, when I teach the voting rights class and I ask students like, well, what do you think about allowing people who are uh, still in prison to vote? And I point out that in many of our counterpart democracies, even prisoners can cast a ballot. I often get two responses. The first of these is that depriving someone of his voting rights while he is in prison is just part and parcel of his punishment. There's a lot of stuff people in prison can't do while they're locked up, and that's part of the point of locking them up. Ironically, the more important the right to vote is, the more denying it to people seems like a rational form of punishment, at least at some level. But the second response, which is the one I think is more interesting, rests on the United States' distinctive form of aggregation, that is how we determine who's going to be in the legislatures, who's going to be on school boards, who's going to be on city councils and the like. And that's the use of geographic single member districts to elect a huge number of these public offices. Where, my students ask me, should incarcerated people vote if they can vote while they're in jail? If they're permitted to vote where they're housed on election day, there are two possibilities of where they can vote. One is where they're currently housed, and the other is where they came from. If they're permitted to vote where they're housed on election day, there's the possibility, particularly in local elections, that almost the entirety of particular districts would be made up of incarcerated individuals. For example, uh, consider the Iberville Parish, Louisiana School Board. This is a county level school board. Uh, and there are huge prisons in Louisiana. One of the school board's districts would be made up of prisoners and two non-incarcerated individuals. Because you have to have each district has to have the same number of people in it. And you've got all these people in prison. So there's a problem with that in a sense. Because if you only have two uh, individuals in that district who aren't prisoners, um, one of two bad things is likely to happen. Either the prisoners won't vote because they have no interest in a school board election for 
uh, a parish that they didn't come from and it involves issues that are not of concern to them at all. And that would give really huge and disproportionate weight to these two guys who, uh, who live in the district or it being Louisiana, probably uh, one guy and one woman. Um, but uh, you know, it would be very hard to say that that's a fair election where two people get to pick one member of the school board and you know, 4,000 people uh, vote for another member of the school board. Or the prisoners will vote and the votes of individuals with no ties to the community, uh, no real knowledge because they don't get the local newspapers, they don't get the local, you know, they, they, they don't have access to the internet, uh, they don't pay taxes there, and yet they'll be deciding the school policy for the people who actually have to live with the consequences of that policy. So neither of those seems right. If, however, states abandon what P Peter Wagner has ap aptly termed prison gerrymandering, then maybe those individuals should vote from their pre-incarceration addresses. But notice something about that solution, saying that they should vote where they came from. It rests on the proposition, I think, that individuals who are incarcerated remain part of those communities with ongoing ties and intentions to return. Those assumptions are, I want to suggest, at least somewhat inversely correlated to the length of incarceration. We can reasonably assume that a person serving a six-month sentence or a two-year sentence retains those kinds of ties. There's no necessary difference between one of them and one of us who takes a sabbatical and goes away for you. Well, there is. I mean, we can do what we want on our sabbatical, and they're not doing what they want in prison. But you get my basic, the basic gist, right, which is um, we still remain part of the community we came from. We're going to go back there uh, and the like. Um, but those assumptions break down um, if, as a prisoner starts to resemble Rip Van Winkle, you know, absent from his community for decades, uh, from a community that may have changed profoundly in the interim. So think about how that fits into the larger ecosystem of our criminal justice system. Uh, you know, one question we might ask is, why do we assume that prisoners are different in this way from everybody else? We have a federal statute, UACAVA, that allows expat voting uh, by people who can continue to vote in federal elections forever if they were registered to vote in the United States before they moved overseas. And we don't think that's problematic. Um, we permit those people to exercise their subjective sense of their ties to the United States. And this returns us also to the fact that if we didn't incarcerate people for so long, it would be quite reasonable to assume they, they would go back to the communities they came from. This returns us then, I think, to questions of governance. In upholding New York's then existing lifetime disenfranchisement regime, against a challenge that was ironically enough brought by somebody who was convicted under the Smith Act, which was an act uh, of Congress that made it a crime to uh, 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 advocate for the overthrow of the US government, right? So somebody convicted of a, a political crime. Uh, Judge Henry Friendly wrote that it could scarcely be deemed unreasonable for a state to decide that perpetrators of serious crimes should not take part in electing the legislators who make the laws, the executives who enforce these, the prosecutors who must try them for further violations, or the judges who are to consider their cases. A contention that the Equal Protection Clause requires New York to allow convicted mafiosi to vote for district attorneys or judges would not only be without merit, but as obviously so as anything can be. But if a society comes, I think, to understand that many of the individuals who are excluded did not commit serious crimes, and that there are very real arguments about whether the laws under which they were convicted the prosecutors who are, uh, who are uh, enforcing those laws uh, and the judges in many states who are deciding whether they're guilty uh, should uh, be responsive to that community, uh, then it might come, the community might also come to believe that the ability to participate in changing those laws going forward is actually quite important. New York's savagely punitive Rockefeller drug era drug laws were maintained for many years by a state legislature whose overall composition was in part a product of prison gerrymandering. Right? So the people who supported the laws were being elected uh, by people. They were being elected. They then voted for prisons in their district, which provided wealth and employment in their district. And so they had a vested interest in having laws that were unduly harsh. So maybe what we should do, recognize that in the last uh, 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 census before New York started reassigning incarcerated prisoners to where they came from, which the Census Bureau now enables you to do, a state can request the data that allows it to reattribute uh, incarcerated persons back to where they came from, seven New York State Senate districts 
many of them represented by the state's most draconian legislators, met population requirements only because prisoners were included in those districts. And so one thing we've only recently begun to consider is to what extent changing the composition of the electorate by reenfranchising some proportion of offenders will change criminal justice policies going forward. Or perhaps more broadly, reenfranchisement re might change policies regarding the school to prison pipeline. Or even more provocatively, if you've read my colleague John Donahue's 2001 article on the impact of legalized abortion on crime, maybe reenfranchisement will influence the regulation of reproductive autonomy as well. It's too early to tell, but 2020 may give us a first window into answering these questions. Here are just a few of the things I'll be watching for. What will the actual turnout be among the recently reenfranchised? Uh, will uh, various efforts that are being made in several of the states uh, bear fruit or the like? Will offender reenfranchisement have outcome effects in battleground states like Florida or Virginia? Will reattribution of incarcerated persons uh, in the states that have adopted that change the composition or the makeup of state legislatures? Will arguments about procedural hurdles to reenfranchisement spill over into other areas of the new disenfranchisement? Will we ultimately move towards national resolution of these issues or will it remain state by state? And finally, will re offender res restoration remain a consequence of criminal justice reform or will it contribute to further reform itself? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, so we are going to open up questions here. Uh, I want to remind you all, especially my faculty colleagues, a question is a short statement that begins with a question mark. And I'd like to begin So it's not just, am I right or what? <laughs> yeah. Professor Friedman. There was one reason which had always seemed to me quite powerful for disenfranchising people while incarcerated, not afterwards. No. Uh, we're on record together on that one. Uh, and that is, they are not free. They are like slaves in the sense that uh, the people who control every detail of their lives can punish them severely if the outcome of the election can, is seen as having been skewed by the vote in that prison. They're not free people. And th therefore, uh, there's some reason to uh, say, well, not yet. Wait until you get out from under the thumb of the system before you can vote again. Yes, yeah, so that's a really interesting point. I'll make kind of two, I guess maybe three observations about it. One is it fits in directly with one of the other forms of disenfranchisement I think is very little known in the United States, but was true uh, as late as 1934 in some states. If you are in government assistance, you couldn't vote. And the theory, it was the so-called pauper's exclusion. And the theory behind that was you weren't fully free, you were under the thumb of the government, and the government could tell you how to vote. So it wasn't so much they worried that they would punish you afterwards as that they would make you vote a particular way or you'd be afraid to vote in, in a really free way. So that's the, f the first thing is, you know, I think that fits in really well with that. The second thing is, um, we discovered something a little bit like this. I did an empirical study with uh, some gerontologists and um, a neurologist and some social workers about voting in assisted living facilities. I'm sorry, Charles, don't, I, I'm not saying that because you're like still older than me and you'll always be older than me, but um, it, 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 but it was, so we did this empirical study in Philadelphia. Uh, in a hotly contested mayoral election. And what was interesting is we asked the directors of these, uh, activities directors at these places, and they ranged from one person who said, I only will help people get ballots if I feel they really understand the issues in the election, which seems a little high, to at the other extreme, and so the, the range of voting in these facilities ranged from like 0% to 100%. And some of the 100% ones, they said, we think this is a really good activity for the residents, so we just have a party where we request absentee ballots for all of them, and we sit in a room, and we all fill them out together. And there's this worry that, you know, voting is supposed to be secret. 
Now, there are countries that have managed to solve this problem of voting in prisons being secret. So it's not an insoluble problem. But I understand exactly that, that view that if people are under someone else's control, and that was for a long time also why women, one of the justifications for not allowing women to vote is, you know, they, they was just like giving two votes to guys who are married or guys who are fathers because they just march in and do whatever they want. So yeah, I mean, that is another, uh, that is another um, uh, uh, argument for the worry is that free people should vote, not people who are likely to be forced to vote one way or another. Yeah. Eventually, I will ask students to ask questions to make sure I understand. You're going to just cold call on them? I, 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 if I have to, I will. <laughs> oh, they're not free either. <laughs> I'm forcing them to. Uh, you, uh, Pam, you, uh, you raised this question uh, uh, about uh, these two simultaneous uh, phenomena, signs of popular revulsion against offender disfranchisement, uh, 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 and proliferation in state legislatures uh, of uh, ID requirements. How do these things happen at the same time? Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think your, uh, your main explanation uh, was, well, people, referring to you know, popular opinion, uh, people who have come to see that offender disfranchisement doesn't really make sense, still do think, you know, see how an ID requirement does make sense. Uh, I just, uh, I, I find that uh, persuasive. But uh, I, I just want to, to float before you a kind of supplementary or complementary explanation for this, uh, which is that uh, ID laws emanate from legislatures, primarily state legislatures, uh, uh, not from public opinion, but from state legislatures. And um, I'm, imagining a, I'm imagining a state legislature, for example, like Florida's, uh, but where they don't quite have the chutzpah that the Florida legislature has, uh, has shown in response to the referendum. Uh, uh, and those legislators uh, sit there and they say, well, uh, we really have to give in to this tide of public opinion about offender uh, disfranchisement. We have, to, we have to let go on that. But we can recover some of the lost ground in terms of our machination of the electorate by going the ID route. In other words, we have to give up, you know, we have, yeah. to, we, have to, uh, we have to give up 75 yards of the field, but we can get 40 yards of it back. And that makes the whole thing easier for us. So we yield on offender disfranchisement, but uh, we can uh, recover with ID laws. So, I'm just wondering whether that sounds to me as though it would kind of fit uh, uh, the general uh, uh, structure of, of your talk. I mean, I actually got that idea uh, when you moved on uh, from uh, uh, from this question to the uh, to the aftermath in Florida. Yeah, that 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 also is a a, a great point. Um, in some of the states, the sequence is the other way around, though. That is, they started imposing the laws. Really, the 2000 election. Is, so if you go back to 1987, 1988, I think there were like two states that had voter ID laws, and now a majority of states do. They're all partisan. That is, I don't think a single state in which Democrats have unified control has adopted one of these. They're all in uh, Republican states. Um, and some of them antedate the huge surge in offender reenfranchisement. So in those states, um, I, I think it is more the popular, the popular position versus the legislature's position. But I think you're right in some places that that would explain, that would explain what's going on. Hello. Um, I was wondering if the argument is made um, for those in the, in the system, which could be in prison or still in the system, that giving them the right to vote would produce um, incentives for those seeking office to, uh, you know, to speak to their main concerns, which might introduce sort of unwanted 
externalities on, on what people were running for office on the basis of. So, so one man's externality is another man's internality, right? Um, so I think the argument is in part that, that if these folks could vote, it would be a good thing for, um, you know, for, for example, uh, candidates might run more on making sure there are more re-entry programs and that those programs are more effective, and that would be a good thing, right? So, I, I, you know, if, if it's the candidate's going to campaign on a policy platform that promises to give something to uh, either currently incarcerated people or ex-offenders, my normative commitment is that's a good thing because, right, Well, so there's the, there's the kind of the, 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 you know, the Henry Friendly view that I, that I quoted from the, the, the old cases. You shouldn't appeal to these people, but that presupposes that the existing laws are fair, right? If, if the existing laws are fair, then it's not clear why you should change them to, uh, you know, to uh, cater to the people who were fairly convicted under fair laws and fairly sentenced. But if you think those things are up for grabs, then I think there it's hard to make the argument that candidates shouldn't appeal uh, to them in the same way that it's hard to make the argument that they shouldn't be appealing to farmers who want you know, more subsidies for crops or uh, coal miners who want more subsidy for uh, coal or the like. Thank you very much. So it was a wonderful talk. Um, my question has to do with the relationship of this project with political philosophical views about the nature or the correctness of our current criminal justice system or punishment system. Yeah. So I, let me see if I, let me throw this out and see if I get you right. I think that your view about uh, people who've served their time, their reenfranchisement, that the need to do that is fairly orthogonal to one's views about the propriety and justifiability of our current criminal justice system or punishment system in the sense that you could imagine the most beautiful, wonderful, justified version of those institutions and you would still feel reenfranchisement is necessary. But when it comes to the disenfranchisement of those currently serving the sentences, that may not be true and that it may depend on one's view of the adequacy of our existing criminal law or punishment. So I'm just curious if that is the correct way to read you. Um, I, I, th I think so, but I want to make sure that I'm getting uh, that I'm getting this exactly right. Which is, if you had a, f it, because it, to some extent, I would build into a truly fair criminal justice system reintegrates the people who are not going to be kept in jail for the rest of their life uh, into the political process. So it's hard to imagine a system that's beautifully fair and wonderful in every respect. But just this one thing, which is once you commit any crime, no voting for you. It, so so it, it's, not, it's not super orthogonal, but it might be that the two things, I would be less concerned about a number of the, dis, not lifetime disenfranchised, but I'd be much less concerned with, for example, saying that people who are serving a sentence don't get to vote, it, the fairer I think the process that puts them in jail is, because it may just be one of those things where it's up for a democracy to decide one of the ways we punish you in the same way that we deny you a bunch of your other First Amendment rights when you're in jail, um, not to mention all of your Fourth Amendment rights as far as I can tell. Um, we deny you this particular fundamental right for some, pe for some period of time. Um, but in a system where we don't do that, then I think is that, is, is that responsive to your question, Glenn? I just want to make sure. It is, although I think that you're, I, I would have thought you're uh, harder against that question than Pauline has said. It seems to me that your usual case is that once you've served your time, there is no reason to disenfranchise the people who are in your time. Right. Assuming whatever the system is, perfect criminal justice, perfect system, you can find it. Whereas here, I think I hear you say that might be right, but I don't hear it. No, no, I think, that, I think that's right. I, I, what I was trying to do is say I don't think it's orthogonal on the question of currently incarcerated people. I do think it's totally orthogonal on the question because I think a fair criminal justice system does not impose a lifetime punishment on somebody for conviction of a crime, except, I mean, Maryland, for example, has this really interesting thing where, it's, where it's, I think they, right now, they, they disenfranchise you while you're in prison. They might do it on parole. And then it's a lifetime disenfranchisement for people convicted of election crimes, 
And there, you might say, well, it's kind of proportional. It's sort of fitting, and it's about incapacitation, which is, although very few people are convicted of an election crime that involves their vote, as opposed to them buying votes or stuffing ballot boxes or like. But maybe you could imagine that being a proportional, a proportional punishment, but otherwise not. Um, well, first of all, thank you for um, a very clear case for the um, injustice of disenfranchisement um, of both incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals. But I was wondering um, what you would consider um, the path forward to be, like both ethically and legally, um, whether those are the same or different. Would this be something dealt with at a federal constitutional level or at the state level? And if, if that diverges, then, then how so? Yeah, so um, the path forward in the short run has to be legislative because the Supreme Court has said there's no constitutional right for somebody who's been convicted of a crime to get the right to vote back. And the way they got there, as I, as I suggested in the talk, was they read um, section two of the 14th Amendment, which says you can't, you can't, you, we're going to take seats in Congress away from states that deny people the right to vote, except for conviction of a crime as saying, it's OK. Um, there's some very interesting work that's been done by some historians suggesting that it's not clear that the 15th Amendment doesn't override that um, and the like. So you, know, you could imagine at some future time with some different court, uh, you might get a constitutional claim. There's a second set of constitutional cases, some of which have succeeded and some of which haven't, which are ones that show that the state adopted or maintained uh, the disenfranchisement law it had for the precise purpose of discriminating on the basis of race. Um, so Hunter against Underwood, the case where the Alabama law got struck down is an example of that. There's a case involving a Mississippi law that a different Mississippi law than the one I talked about in Cotton against Fordyce got struck down. But that kind of litigation is tough. Under the Voting Rights Act, the litigation all ultimately failed. It went to en banc uh, courts. So the full court heard it in the Ninth Circuit involving a case from Washington State uh, and in the Second Circuit involving a case from New York State. And the courts just were not buying. So I don't think litigation, at least under federal statutes or the federal constitution right now, is likely to succeed. Um, you might end up with, na with, national, with something national uh, if the Democrats were to have control of both houses of Congress uh, and the presidency, because uh, in HR1 they have a democracy restoration provision, and it's wildly popular uh, in the Democratic Party. So there's no reason to think if they had the ability they wouldn't pass that. Hard to know at what point that might happen at some point in the future. Um, in the interim, it's going to be at the state level. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in some states, the governor can do a lot for this. So one of the things that happened in, in Virginia was the governor got an auto pen and just started signing all of the restoration things because they required that the governor sign them to get people restored to the voting rolls. And, you know, there's a limit to how fast you can write. You know you take exams, right? I mean, how many pages can you write? So the governor got an auto pen and it just started signing things. Um, so some places you can do executive orders. Uh, there was a, the previous governor in Florida to the current governor, who's not so good on this, um, started restoring a lot of people's rights very quickly. Um, there are initiatives in a lot of states. I mean, it's unfamiliar to folks in the Northeast because the Northeast doesn't really have the initiative process, but in a lot of parts of the country, citizens can get something on the ballot. In Florida, that's how they did it. They put it on the ballot for the citizens to vote for. So I think you'll see some, you'll see some more of that. Um, but I don't think you're going to see litigation over, with, over the broad picture anytime soon. You are seeing lots of litigation in Florida. I mean, the ACLU is down there. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund is down there litigating about whether the legislature is trying to essentially override the will of the people on, on reenfranchisement. Is that kind of what you're asking about? By action prescription, do you mean like? Well, everybody should be doing it, right? I mean, the courts should the courts should recognize that this is this is an irrational. I, I mean, I wrote a piece suggesting that this was cruel and unusual punishment. That we should stop arguing about the Fourteenth Amendment's 
uh, equal protection clause and just say that this violates the Eighth Amendment's cruel and unusual punishment clause to disenfranchise, especially the lifetime disenfranchisement, which is, you know, any felony, you know, I, I, I don't want to scare you, but you've probably committed five or six felonies in, you know, I mean, have you used your cell phone? Did you ever say anything to anybody? Don't say this because I'm not your lawyer, but imagine that you might have said something false to somebody on a cell phone at some point. That's wire fraud. Um, you know, I, it, no, I mean, seriously, you were, you were, you know, somebody else got in the car with you and they had some marijuana. That's possession, even if you yourself don't smoke it, right? I mean, it, it, I know Carol's like in this total panic about how she's going to get all these people out of jail. But the, <laughs> the, the fact is that it's very, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of felonies out there that the government could charge you with. I mean, you could end up, somebody might recognize, recommend seven to nine years in jail for you, even though you're totally innocent of everything. And if the president doesn't intervene, you might get sentenced. So there are... God, I should not say things like this. I'm already in trouble enough. But not among us. No. But the, the, the point I'm just making is that the idea that you would be disenfranchised for life for a relatively minor thing done very early in your life seems to me to be cruel and unusual punishment. And so, you know, I would argue I would argue that on top of everything else. But in reality, it's gonna it's gonna have to be the political process that does this. So such an interesting topic, Pam. I, I'm kind of curious about your take, not so much on the contrast between attitudes about uh, voter ID and uh, felon disenfranchisement, um, but about views about the uh, reenfranchisement of incarcerated people now as compared to earlier times. So I'm just trying to understand why now, why, there is such bipartisan support, not just in Florida, but across the country for reenfranchisement. Granted, it is uh, greater among Democrats, but still a majority of Republican yeah. uh, voters support reenfranchisement. And I'm just trying to understand what the story is. So the story you tell is that people have realized that it doesn't promote the purposes of punishment. This isn't quite doing it for me because we do all kinds of crazy things in our criminal justice system that don't plausibly support the purposes of punishment. And we don't see strong majorities for changing those things. We're starting to see some little bipartisan, but like we're talking first step back, like baby, baby, baby step toward dealing with some of the most extreme, extreme, extreme malfunctions of the criminal justice system. So why this, why now? Because I'm guessing, although I don't know this for sure, that most felon disenfranchisement laws go way back to a time actually when we actually believed or people thought and, and said publicly that the criminal justice system rehabilitated people, that that was the theory of indeterminate sentencing. And if you believe that, you would think, well, then you would be for reenfranchisement then and now our system is more retributive and deterrent, and you might be for disenfranchisement now, but it's the opposite. And so I'm just trying to, I'm just not, I myself don't have a good story, and I just am inviting you to, to uh, think, offer more um, speculation about yeah. why now. Yeah, so let me clarify one thing and then try to answer the why this, why now. The, the clarification I want to make is I don't think most people who are supporting offender reenfranchisement have thought their way through the four purposes of punishment and which one or other does it does it serve and reach the conclusion that it's irrational. I mean, that's more framework. So I don't think that's what it is. I think some of it is that um, the story of redemption is a very powerful story for people. And, it, and the, this can be framed as a, you paid your debt to society, and now you ought to be brought back into the community. And I think that is something that's more popular now than it was you know, at the height of the fear of you know, super predators and the like. I mean, so I think in that sense, it is part of a change, you know, that's come out of 
huge amounts of work that has been done al along a huge number of different dimensions, some of which you've written about, some of which you know Michelle Alexander has written about, that people are more concerned about just the, the massive over-incarceration and over-criminalization in a way that they weren't for a long period of time. Now, why that? You're better qualified to answer than I am. You know, why people, na why now? So why this? Well, one of the things is this is a relatively costless way of signaling all of this, as opposed to let's really figure out how we're going to do education in prison that enables people to get good jobs, or let's really talk about ban the box. All of those seem more costly in some ways than just saying you've paid your debt to society, now come and be a responsible human being and take on a duty right, as opposed to getting a benefit, uh, right? So voting can be simultaneously cast as this great privilege, but also this responsibility that you really ought to be doing. So it doesn't seem like you're getting something in quite the same way that a lot of other programs may be. So maybe that's some of it. But it's really, it's really striking just how popular offender reenfranchisement is. I mean, it's just, you know, no matter what polling you do, it's like it's 65 to 80 percent. It doesn't matter what the demographic is. It doesn't even matter really what you ask. People just really love it. Um, and some of it also is these, you know, in Florida, they did this really effective campaign where they had, I mean, you know, you just wanted to cry every time you saw these people talking in the ads and stuff about their desire to vote again. Um, you know, so it has, it has the ability to have a narrative that's very powerful and it's about redemption and it's about, um, you know, it just has a lot of, it has a lot of oomph to it that a lot of the other things that might be really important for reintegrating people don't seem to have. Is that, is that at all persuasive? I mean, you're nodding into the sympathy, but I can't tell if it's any of us agreement. <laughs> Many many people may see it as costless, uh, but Republican politicians don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the interesting thing is, some of them do but not at the state level. That is, the national ones seem to be more in favor of it than at the state level. And I think some of it depends on what kind of state you're from. That is, if you're from a state that's either safely, safely red or safely, safely blue, again, it doesn't have any outcome effect. So those people, you know, Lindsey Graham is not worried, right? He should be worried about other things. Hypothesis is pretty powerful since it tracks them. Yeah, I, I, I should go through more carefully, but it's interesting to me. It's like Orrin Hatch, you know, he's out of Congress now and he's in favor of it and he's from Utah. Enough said. Question from a student? We have debates televised from we have debates televised from prisons. We have campaigning that's happening inside prisons. We have money involved in our electoral process. I just want to kind of think that out with you. And like my gut says, like let it rip. But I'm wondering what are the unintended consequences and what are these other things that could happen? Well, this goes to Charles's point in in a way, which is the prisons have total control at this point over who enters a prison and who doesn't. So if you think that it's necessary to have the candidates actually in the prison to campaign, then Charles is absolutely right. There's a real problem with allowing incarcerated people to vote if the prison allows one side's folks in and doesn't allow the other side's folks in, um, or it restricts the information that they're getting in various ways. So what's the unintended consequence of having prisoners vote? I think in leaving aside those problems, which are not inconsiderable, about just how do you run the election and the like, um, assuming that they're reattributed back to where they're from, I don't think there's huge outcome effects. If they're not reattributed back to where they're from and they vote in the prison, then I do think you have the possibility of local elections in which 
a group of people who have no real stake in the community could determine the outcome of elections. And it's not like the thing that sometimes you hear, which is students shouldn't be allowed to vote in college towns. I mean, there were, there were a long series of cases in the Second Circuit about whether New York could have an irrebuttable presumption that students didn't live on campus. I don't mean that they didn't live on campus, that, they, that their, their campus address was not the address from which they should vote. And ultimately, those were struck down by the Second Circuit. But there, at least what you can say is, even if no one student really is a long-term member of that community. There's a community of floating students who will care about the liquor laws, the zoning laws, the, you know, the where are the bike rack laws and stuff like that, so that they're, they're in the community. Prisoners are not in the community in that way. That is, they don't buy things on the local economy. They don't pay local taxes. Their children are generally not in the local school system and the like. So there, you could have terrible unintended consequences if you, um, if you didn't reattribute prisoners for uh, voting, voting purposes back to where they came from. So no pressure at all. We have time for one more question. So we have a really, really good one. Really, really good. There's a really good question. Go ahead. Either a student or a attorney. Just a concerned citizen. But I once was a divinity student here, so I guess I'm still a student, okay? My question is about money. Did you find in your research that private and public prisons have different perspectives on this question? And if so, do they play a major part in the legislative process? So the answer to that is both private prisons and I can say from personal experience in California, the Correctional Guards Union play a huge role in uh, state-level politics. Um, they both have an incentive. So um, I, I should disclose that I represented the California Association of Peace and Correctional Officers in a case where they actually joined with the prisoners to sue the state of California over medical conditions in the prison because the guards were all getting drug resistant TB and that MRS, the thing that eats bits, bits of your body away. So they were, they, sorry to say this right before dinner, but uh, they, they, they joined there with the prisoners. But of course their incentive there to join with the prisoners was both their own health and you need to build more prisons if you're gonna have this number of people because you can't pack them in this tightly. Um, so yes, prison, both the correctional, the private corporations that have in their portfolio private detention facilities and um, correctional officers unions are heavily involved in spending on state legislative races. So I don't know in Florida, because I don't know whether Florida runs a, has outsourced a lot of its prisons. And that's, that's what you'd want to know. And I just don't know that. So I lied. We have time for a question after the last question. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's being challenged right now in Florida. In part, they're using the claim that it's a poll tax. That the 24th Amendment, I think it is, says that uh, your right to vote can't be conditioned on the payment of any tax. And what they're claiming is that this is the functional equivalent of a tax. Um, you know, in some states, it's a it's litigation over whether the the inability, if you can show that you're simply unable to pay it, it should nonetheless stand in your way because there are a bunch of, there are a bunch of um, old Supreme Court cases um, that were about, you couldn't jail people for fa failure to pay a fine if they really couldn't pay the fine. And so they're trying to use those cases as well. Um, and then there's litigation in some states over whether the fact that you haven't paid all of the fees and fines attached to a criminal sentence means the sentence hasn't been completed yet. 
Um, and so that's just a matter of statutory construction about how the state interprets its law, as opposed to the kind of um, uh, stuff that the ACLU and the, um, and the uh, Legal Defense Fund are litigating in Florida right now. You made every question count, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you.